Dear colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Leif Stenberg, I'm the director of the Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations at Dover Khan University. And while working on a book entitled Globalization and the Muslim World, Culture, Religion and Modernity, published by Syracuse University Press in 2004, I searched, along with my co-editor, for a new way of illustrating the cover of the book. We finally decided that an abstract work of art by a Lebanese artist would adorn the book's cover. Our idea was that the artwork should reflect a globalized world, not least culturally, but also the term, the Muslim world. And in our opinion, the term, the Muslim world, can no longer be perceived only as a physical, geographical, or geographic location. The abstract painting we finally choose for the cover of the book is certainly culturally indecisive. It is part of a modern art that cannot be given a specific location and hence easily be described as Islamic or Arab art. Rather, the drawing shows how modern art is transnational and human and, and, give the, and to give the painting a home by only looking at it would certainly be difficult. I know that a similar discussion about how to locate, for example, heritage in a global and transnational world has been taking place in the field of contemporary architecture for many years. I also remember as a young student studying the scholarly discussion about if a city, historic or contemporary, can be Islamic or not. A discussion that is at, at, at its heart concerned, concerning or concerned in conceptualizations of the terms Islam and Muslim and at the same time, a discussion that is still ongoing and involves how to designate a city or a world. But in addition, to understand the processes that makes it possible for us as scholars to call something Islamic or Muslim in general. I would presume that most of us would consider contemporary art and architecture as border crossing and transnational. At the same time, I presume a building is always in a context related to a specific condition or conditions. And the place where a new building is erected it changes the environment and influences the social space and society surrounding it. <coughs> Sometimes, with what perhaps can be called with a critical edge, a political and social dimension, and sometimes going beyond the expectations and being a sign of creativity, such as hopefully illustrated by the image of the relatively new Isam Fares Institute at the campus of the American University of Beirut. The dynamic and complex expressions of architecture that we find in the Middle East today are produced from a variety of perspectives. Some traditional and classical expressions and others, what, and others what can perhaps be described as wild and hyper-modern visible in cities like Dubai or Doha. At the Aga Khan University Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations, they have an ambition to study, analyze, and discuss topics that broadly concern Muslim cultures. We desire to go beyond the usual stereotypes linked to different identities and belongings that are associated with the region usually defined as the Muslim world, a world that can, following my earlier remarks, exist in London as well as in Kuala Lumpur. We strive to be ambitious in our outreach programs, and being in the beautiful Aga Khan Center, center that's this building, gives us an opportunity to reach out to the public in London and beyond. That is wonderful, and the cliche, the sky is the limit, seems to me to be an appropriate statement. 
Today's event is the first in a series of 10 public events interrogating how architecture, planning and contemporary creativity enhance and affect both quality of life and sustainability in a range of Muslim contexts, but also part of an approach in which we like to organize discussions, seminars and workshops that widen perspectives and talk about Muslim context beyond, for example, world politics and Islamist movements. We, we do that too, but the ambition is broader as exemplified by this series of lectures. In relation to this particular series of lectures we initiate today, I'm very grateful to people who have planned the series. Raj Isar, not present, but I do like to thank him publicly. Stefan Presin, professor here at the Institute, and also our communication and marketing manager, Alex Kahn. Thank you warmly. I'm also grateful for the support and the collaboration with the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome today's distinguished speakers, uh, Farouk Derakshani, Director of the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, Hanif Kara, Professor in Practice and Architectural Technology at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University, and Farshad Musavi, Professor in Practice and Architectural Technology at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University. Our esteemed guests will talk under the title of Architecture in the Muslim World, but also Cultural Heritage, Urban Architecture and Creativity in Muslim Settings. A special thanks also goes to Luin Monreal, Managing Director of the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, and I welcome him to deliver the opening remarks. Thank you all. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I was a few minutes ago in a taxi, in a London cab, and I thought you, that you may be very lucky, because I would be so late that you will spare my words. But you've been unlucky. We only started uh, 10 minutes late. I was unfortunately in time to talk to you tonight. As um, Liv Stenberg has said, this is the first of uh, 10 events jointly organized by the Institute of, for the Study of the Muslim Civilizations and the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, that uh, from now on, which I will call AKTC, that is simpler, that will explore with very good speakers through debates and dialogue, um, cultural heritage, urban architecture, and creativity in the Muslim settings. This is a world of plurality, of diverse, geographic spread, social diversity, and I'm sure the environmental, the environmental role of architecture, its social role, will be discussed tonight and in the other events of this series. Why this program? Let me briefly explain to you why we co-organize this program. First of all, AKTC has for a long time, in one hand through the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, in the other hand, through the Historic Cities program, amassing a trove of data and information about and knowledge about what is the built environment in the Muslim world, past and present, and has developed a lot of thinking about what could be the future. And we thought, the designers the other can thought that it was time to start sharing this uh, amass of uh, information this reservoir of architectural and planning projects, for example, which are in Farouk Zarraqsani's now uh, archives in an electronic form, um, uh, archives that have been collected for the past 41 years of the award. Um, also, that we will need to put together and make available to the professionals, to the general public, to the students, um, all these um, experience collected by the Historic Cities program, experience in terms of urban planning in historic cities, rehabilitation, conservation, and in many different social contexts. What we hope to be the constituencies or the audiences of this uh, education program, jointly undertaken among other institutions with the Institute for the Study of the Muslim Civilizations. First of all, the first audience is you is the scholar, 
the professional, the conservation specialist, the urban planners, the professionals. Second is curricular education. Uh, we want to reach um, all the levels of curricular education and the program uh, under the direction of Rashizar that was recently mentioned will is putting together massive online open courses, curricular units, winter schools, workshops, publications, etc. But the program, and this is a third audience, also aims to reach the public in general, a broader outreach um, for which these specialized fields are not always understandable or available. And as the, the Agacan Award for Architecture does, this is a movement in two directions, toward the Muslim world, but to the world, towards the Western world, from the Muslim world, from the Western world. Today, as you said, in any case, the Muslim world is everywhere. It's not the geographic divisions of uh, do not do not uh, uh, are not relevant anymore. Um, and we are celebrating more than 40 years of activity of the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, an award that celebrates from its very beginning architectural excellence, and that has put into the table of discussion what is the social and the environmental role of architecture. Many architectural awards of great prestige is simply a, an example or an exercise of, excuse me, the architects here, uh, Farshi, but it's an exercise of uh, self-masturbation, um, let's say, of between architects uh, enjoying themselves without not looking and um, what is the social value of architecture um, and the other kind of what has um, brought together during these 40 years are in a high intellectual exercise, many architects, urban planners, uh, thinkers, philosophers, archaeologists, uh, writers who have been all thinking together about what is architecture, what should be architecture today and tomorrow in the Muslim world and elsewhere. And as encouraged and promoted architects, clients and users to learn from their heritage and to build in ways that respond to the needs and aspirations to contemporary societies. In subsequent uh, events of this uh, series uh, undertaken with the Institute for the Study of the Muslim Civilizations, other topics will be discussed that will be based on the experiences collected by the Historic Cities Programme of AKTC, a programme that uh, aspires to uh, revitalise urban historic settings through conservation, through um, putting in value a cultural heritage that in most cases is the most valid economic asset for the future of the communities that live in those urban contexts. It's also uh, the um, uh, Historic Cities Programme has a programme that deals with the improvement of the living conditions, quality of life, and that attempts to dynamise local economies by, <coughs> through these activities, um, creating new jobs, providing vocational training, and having a real impact in the socio-economic uh, development of the populations. All these things, you, if you continue to attend these uh, evening uh, events, uh, will be based in practical examples, in examples that have taken care <coughs> in countries as different as Cairo, um, uh, Kabul, Herat, Damascus, Aleppo, Delhi, Hyderabad, uh, Bamako, uh, Mopti, or Timbuktu. And um, Tonight we are going to have three, two speakers and one moderator. Um, and you have, all of you, you have the biodata of our guests tonight. So I'm not going to tell what they are. I'm going to tell what I think about them. First of all, <laughs> I'm going to talk about Farsi Gusavi, which I think uh, in the, through the um, many years, um, observing her in uh, debates of the Award for Architecture, observing, if I, I, I put a, a, 
a, a film. Well, that's why why people are so <laughs> <laughs> Be careful, don't put the wrong film behind it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Farsi, let's come back to, to you. I think I, I am always impressed when I see you in a, a public debate, in a group situation, of how incisive you are. You must have not a brain, you have a, on top of a brain, you have a springboard in your head that makes you jump with a, a kind of a, a world record intellectual speed into the topic of discussion and um, I, I admire your passion in, in that discussion and, and the way you can turn the arguments in a way that you make your opponents totally, totally seduced and destroyed. <laughs> Hanif is the opposite. <laughs> Hanif, which, well, I, I must say, let me, let me come back to Farshid first. Uh, Farshid is probably one of the most innovative uh, genius of her generation. Um, in spite of her age, she occupies today a position in contemporary architecture in that uh, don't judge her by her young uh, appearance, she has a gravitas <laughs> that uh, doesn't correspond to her appearance. But uh, Hanif, as I said, is the opposite. Hanif is probably the most creative engineer, and you know engineers, I don't know if the microphone works still, uh, engineers have the reputation of not being creative. Well, here you have an oxymoron. Is, uh, Hanif is a very creative engineer uh, without hyperbole and is the person that makes possible that architects that have a dream could realize their dream. You know, architects think about forms and structures, but sometimes they don't find an engineer like Hanif and they cannot build them. <laughs> Hanif is behind some of the most astonishing buildings and he is kind, a kind of a person in the background. And you will see that's part of his personality. He never speaks, reacts very quickly like uh, Farsi because he thinks a lot. And uh, he, his processor works very well. And um, well, I, I'm, I'm sure that this dichotomy of personalities that you will have in front of you tonight is going to be something interesting. And as a moderator, uh, we will have my colleague and, and friend Farouk Deraksani, which has been the director of the Aga Khan Award for Architecture successfully for so many years. Let me finish by thanking you, uh, the director, Liv Steinberg, uh, the director of the uh, Ismaili uh, Center for the Study of the uh, Muslim Civilizations, and all your staff for having taken care of organizing this evening. And now, Enjoy. Thank you. Lewis, for all the nice things you've said, which are all of them are almost true. <laughs> so, and thank you for inviting all of us here. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to talk about architecture because architecture, we've, you know, as architects, we've been to school and they've told us that we've got one of the best disciplines that one can learn because they can change the world. Well, actually, a lot of people think that they can change the world. But the problem with architects is that sometimes when they do something, and if they go wrong, they make a very bad change in the world. Um, there's one thing which is very important, because we had an, as a um, title of our, our, one of our last publications that architecture is life. And first, it, there was the thought that that was a very strong statement, that architecture is life. But in fact, Architecture is one of the disciplines which uh, has got an impact on our everyday life more than any other discipline ever think about it because we, are, we wake in the, in, in, a, in the space which is architecture, we work, we go streets, architecture and planning and landscape because when we're talking architecture, architecture is not only a matter of building one building, architecture is 
as we say, if you move a stone and put it from one place in, to the other, that's architecture because you're changing what's in the nature. And, th and also, there's one thing which is very important that we've inherited. Every single society, if you talked about Dubai and Doha, and then here we've got London, one can say that architecture is a manifestation of a society. It's what you see, what the reality of the society is. Sometimes you see chaos in some countries, and it's a chaos, also you can see it in the way that the cities look like, like the cities that buildings look like, and the certain places that you've got this very, it's very, everything is very rational. So because not only we're not talking about one building when we're talking about architecture, we're talking about the whole built environment. Um, today, I'm lucky to have Farshid and Hanif with me. Uh, we've been, we've known each other for quite some, some years, I'm saying. And one of the good things about the Arc and the Wolf architecture is that first you work with people and then you become friends. It's not the other way around. So uh, this is very important and I've been very lucky working with both of them. And then uh, they have been, both of them, they've been on awards master juries and then also both of them have been on the award steering committees because the structure we have, the Wolf architecture, which is an award given every three years, it's a one million dollar um, award given to projects which are completed and then are in use and there should be wherever they are in the world they should be in service of Muslims or inspired by Muslim uh, culture. Uh, before going into the details because first of all as the three of us were sitting here we're somehow associated with the Ark and Wolf architecture we thought that it would be good as an introduction but we will show you a, f a part of a film so it's four or five minutes and then we should, we'll explain instead of we, each of us explain what the world is and why we're here and what means architecture in which context we're talking about architecture. And then after that, I'm going to ask Madam and Monsieur 10 questions. So that is going to be this evening. That's how it's going to be happening. Uh, let me see if I can make this thing work. Sound. Stop. I cannot stop. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot say go ahead. Yeah, yeah stop. You know, technology is not innocent. I can see that. I think it's a big issue. Actually, I don't know what they do to the computer. Well, I can explain the film. Thank you. 
The spectrum is much wider than just yeah. looking at yeah. kind of the flow of the It's very special, meaning it recognizes the real work of an architect. It's a scriptural quality he has on society, community. And it forces architects to rethink the role rather than master designers, but maybe as mobilizers and activists and concerned with the politics of human condition. The Argo Khan Award for Architecture is given every three years to projects that set new standards of excellence in architecture, not only in the design of new buildings but in the whole spectrum of related fields. From restoration and conservation of historic monuments, to landscape architecture, to infrastructure projects, to large-scale urban planning. The definition of architecture for the award is a much wider definition than normally understood as architecture. Because it is about the quality of life, it's about civil society, and His Highness insists in a, in a very positive way on that. We have this wide frame. We have set in motion a process of real promise, a process which, with God's grace, can help to produce an enhanced quality of life for Muslims throughout the world. Founded by His Highness the Aga Khan in 1977. The award has established a reputation as one of the most prestigious and coveted prizes in its field. This cycle, the prize fund has been increased to one million dollars. His Highness made a decision to increase the, the prize money. I believe that he did that with the sensitivity to the fact that the prize money is going to provide assistance and encouragement for more initiatives. We have seen that cremated projects produce offsprings. And I think that this is where its agency and power lies in encouraging more of uh, the good initiatives. The high standing of the award is rooted in the unique rigor of its selection process. Each three year cycle sees the appointment of a new master jury made up of world renowned architects critics, artists, and philosophers. The jury is overseen and advised by an eminent steering committee chaired by His Highness Iyaga Khan. 
understand if they do it in short, not the process of organization. The jury meets to consider nominations and select a shortlist. The shortlist of finalists are then visited on site by expert reviewers who collect information on all aspects of each project. What the technical reviewer does is go right into the detail, check all the figures and facts at one level, but also get the, the real experience of the people, how the people are using the building. So that you can put a much deeper picture together for the master jury to assess. The reviewers present their findings in person to the master jury to help them decide which of the finalists should be awarded the ultimate prize. I was totally amazed with the level of details that's been discovered by the reviewers. I've said before in juries of pure architecture, this is different, this is totally different. Our technical reviewers were magnificent. Some of the ones they are fantastic storytellers and conversation with technical reviewers were one of the highlights of this particular uh, cycle review for me. From that analysis, it allowed us as a jury to quickly understand <coughs> which projects really achieved excellence and went beyond just the imagery of photographs that were presented to us. Um, just this was a small introduction to see how the whole system works. Through 40 years of every three years of this cycle, we have awarded 116 projects. So each time, depending between 50, sorry, between 15 and uh, 5 and 15 projects have been awarded. But what means to give an award? We give an award to highlight the importance of projects for people to see some examples that these are how you can, it, it means how people can change the world in a positive way. So by each time by grouping them, we try to uh, cover different geographies, different type of typologies, different kinds of interventions, just to mention that the, the building should be complete and in use. So that's why that we're actually dealing with something which is real. Um, talking about that, we're going to go through these different uh, buildings and different issues that you saw in the film. Because what we are talking about is architecture is an agent for change. And now I'm just uh, asked this question that we've heard how the role of an award is as an agent of change. Do you think it has been successful in retreating the way architecture is defined and practice? And if so, how? So we talk about now the practice and how it has been an agent for change. Uh, um, well, good evening, everyone. Um, well, uh, as, as uh, we've seen, obviously, a small, tiny glimpse of what the award um, celebrates. Um, and, and I'm not really sure whether uh, it comes at, you know, adequately across uh, of how um, widely uh, it looks at the process of making um, an architectural, let's say, project. Uh, it is from all the way from the initiatives that people who decide that some form of change through a building is necessary, uh, how they mobilize themselves and become, uh, if you like, a, a kind of a tribe uh, that, uh, you know, um, works quite hard towards even the beginning steps towards selecting a site, towards selecting an architect, uh, then, uh, you know, forming a larger group of, um, of people uh, that the architect works with, it's not just the architect, uh, and then going through several years of design uh, and, um, you know, shaping the project, at some, sometimes against odds, uh, and then realizing a project uh, with also future in mind. And I think that that's what's really special about the projects that, you know, an Agacon award is not given to a project the minute it finishes. It's also a project that has somehow lived the test of times for a number of years. Uh, and, 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 you know, it, it, the future is always part of what a project is also thinking. It's not about change now. It might be very slow change. 
So it's it's there are many ways that the I think the award uh, sets examples through a project. Uh, and I have learned looking at, at projects, it may be that I look at a project that is somewhere very far from the place I may ever practice. But there are always, uh, I think, lessons that one can learn from it. And it, as I said, it's about each one of these layers in individually, as well as the complete project. I don't know if you want to add to this. No, I can, I can, without overlapping too much on it, I'll probably take it to remind everyone, 40 years is quite a long time and not many buildings stand up for that long. So the direct answer to whether the award and its effect on architects and practice has been, uh, has had one of change for the positive largely, the answer is yes. There's, there's no doubt about that in my mind. At least it's changed the way we build, the way we practice and we learn from each cycle and I think architects learn from each cycle and it, therefore the award itself affects a certain change in the way we practice. If you, just to go a bit further, if you look at the images as you go through, we, we didn't want to show 116 projects and 40 years in, in an hour, but what you'll see generally is certain commonalities. When you look at just the images and not knowing where these buildings might be, you see the vast differences between them. The one to the to your right is kind of a small building in China, which is an inter intervention on a, on a built heritage. So it's trying to take an existing identity and recreate a new identity with a hutong uh, in China. And the one to the left, which is an incredible building that everybody probably knows in Bangladesh, has transformed the way architects think in that part of the world. So even, uh, even just the way we imagine these buildings, changes by looking at references from the award. I would just add something to, to what you're saying is that just having the two examples is that how the building is not only changing the way that architects look. The, I mean just for example that here we've got this one the building in Bangladesh. It has changed uh, uh, um, idea in the people because when it was given an award it was in a country where democracy didn't exist that, that, that. And this was a symbol of democracy. And it shows a building can be a symbol to change a society. Also, it was a young country. In a young country, one building became a, a new symbol of that country. Because for example, in this case, it was Bangladesh, we just had an interview with a lot of them. And they were saying that the second to the, uh, the, the Tiger of Bengal, this is what they see as a symbol of their nation. And that's very important that how architecture can have an impact on not only the the individual people, but that the society, and that was just to see that how that can be the age of the change. It's not only from a building point of view, but it's the way it's been seen and perceived by the society. That's important. My second question is: there's because we're talking about um, design excellence, and design excellence is something that we always try. I mean, here you're sitting in a in a building which is top of the design excellence and the whole ne neighborhood of, the, uh, of King's Cross is some that you've got a new architecture is going towards excellence but there's some discussion about design excellence could you expand a little on on that and the benefit of our, our audience does architects really have control on excellence yeah, I think the, the good thing about excellence is that certainly within the profession and the definition of excellence within uh, the way practitioners think about it it's how well it's made effectively. Of course, the award goes beyond that. It goes into the excellence that it creates as well. So richness in the way people use the building that's then made with, with excellent construction or excellent design. How does it recreate the way we might use it? So what we're looking at perhaps here, I can't remember these projects, but you can see uh, to the left is uh, again to your right or left. The Alexandria Library and, and I think the other one is some something in Addis Ababa, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, these sorts of projects uh, are built so well, given their context, that they create um, a level of control, at least from the client's perspective and the way they're sold. As to the question that Farouk is asking, I think there has been a time over the last 40 years when architects have lost more and more control over that excellence. So from my perspective, I think the award has been fantastic, mixing with great architects and other disciplines during the committees. 
in reinforcing the fact that unless they regain control, these kind of excellent uh, products are not always made. You will get a lot more homogeneous uh, buildings made by contractors and, and engineers quite often who don't understand excellence beyond the material or beyond a, a thinness of material, uh, which we see around many parts of London, for example. So I would say that to some extent, currently, to not be controversial, but there is a, a lot of homogeneity, and that's partly to do with the fact that architects have lost control of excellence. This just gets fuzzy going now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think um, architects who are worried about losing control um, are trapped in an old way of thinking about architecture. Um, and I think that they are architects who think that the architect has to come up magically with an idea at the beginning, and that idea has to magically become the end. And of course, that's not how buildings are shaped. It was never really the case, uh, and it has become definitely not the case. Uh, you know, projects take four to ten years. At, you know, four would be a very small project. They take, and all kinds of things can come along the way. The world changes. You know, the client changes their mind. You might lose your sight. Building regulations change. Planning regulations change. Your ideas should change over four to ten years. And I, I think that architects who are not engaged in the process and who want to kind of be somebody at the beginning who kind of uh, is an artist and, uh, you know, just controls things as if things are happening in a vacuum, yes, they will lose control because things don't happen that way. But personally, I think that an architecture that is engaged in the process and is able to think and react along the way actually produces a far more sophisticated project and something that he or she could not have even imagined at the beginning. So for me, I, 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 I love the current architectural uh, process. I think it's, it's, it's engaged. Uh, there are a lot of things uh, uh, on the go at the same time. There is a lot of politics at stake. And I think if the architect is engaged, the architect will be able to shape the process to the extent that an architect should, remembering that buildings are about more things than just the architect. Just exactly what you were talking about. The, the, in the building, what, when the building is built, it's not the architect who's the creator, it's the vision of the client. But the vision of the client is very, very important as well. You've got projects who've got good clients and you've got projects who've got bad clients. It depends. And that doesn't necessarily mean that if the bad client gets a good architect, you will get a good architecture. And that is very important. The second thing is that this dialogue, the process, we are talking about excellence in process and we're not talking about excellence in the final product. Because the final product, the excellence, it, it changed. Today, you've seen in London, if other places, all the buildings which were built in 1960s and 70s, and they were built in a way that they were not well done. Now, all of a sudden, in the past 10 years, they try, they come and keep the buildings and change the facades. And all of a sudden, the building becomes, it's got a new skin and a new building, which you can not, I mean, in a way, you can just make it better because that's process important. Now, talking about the contemporary, these changes, but we're talking about heritage. The award premiates a range of projects from um, heritage to through the visibility of contemporary projects. Why it's that important? And I want to just come back to one thing. A lot of people think that the Arc and Wolf architecture is only about traditional buildings, heritage. And that is, uh, uh, that's something which is not correct because we're talking about her heritage and contemporaneity are both part of our life today. We cannot get have one and not the other. It always comes together. So how you see that? So what we're looking at is actually a very good slide then, because both Fashid and I were on the master jury when the one to your left, which is the Petronas Tower, which, you know, kind of is a question about whether that should be viewed as an Islamic project and whether it should ever have been awarded because of its contemporary nature. And it's also a great example of some of the things I think we've already been saying, is that as society changed, the identity, which is what I think the series of 10 lectures is trying to do, you know, it's trying to find how do we define identity through architecture, whether it's a city or a building, 
at that moment in Malaysia, because we both know that project reasonably well, because we fought for it quite a lot to, to put it on, on the map. At that moment, it was in, 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 in a huge issue because oil had just been found. Mathieu, the president at the time, had made a big speech about homogenizing the Malay culture. Yet it was a controversy because the stratification in Malaysia of Chinese, Indians and uh, Malays was also playing out on, on the canvas of colonial, previous colonial past. So when you look at identity being redefined through contemporary thinking, if they've done a domed arch, which is the perception of, of uh, Muslim architecture at that moment, Malaysia would not have got the value that it was trying to create, which was to interlock with modernization of their own identity. Nobody knows whether they were successful or not, it's questionable, but it certainly was something that I recall during that debate that we found quite interesting. That It, it, had, it has a certain reference <coughs> to Indian architecture on plan and so on. The materials are totally new. On the converse side, the other project in Mali is exactly the opposite, in that it is totally reliant on the armature of that culture, because there in Mali they build with mud, and they wanted to retain their their culture in some way. They wanted to to springboard off what they have already. These types of buildings are very temporary because with rain they they wash away and so on. So you know, there knocking that down and building something contemporary would have destroyed the identity. So I think the award takes on a role through the governance, through the, the chairmanship and the steering committee and, and the master jury of its time every three years to try and deal with these issues and doesn't segregate between new and old, but tries to deal with issues of identity, I think, sometimes. Okay, maybe just, just add to that. Um, well, I, you know, I think... Um, uh, we need to remember that the Muslim civilization is a living civilization. It's not a dead civilization. Uh, so obviously, it is. It has. It is blessed with, uh, you know, a fantastic kind of architectural monuments and uh, you know, of small scale, modest and more grand, that are very important to preserve and celebrate. Um, uh, but also because it is a living a living civilization, uh, it needs to also uh, be recognized when it creates contemporary projects that are uh, of great value and, and to also encourage uh, the, the current civilization to add to this rich history and culture of Muslim civilizations and, and uh, keep on evolving this great commitment to the built environment. And I think that that's what the award tries to do. Um, now, um, just an idea is that how you go beyond design and how you can widen the discourse. How and why it is necessary for architects to be part of this wider discourse beyond architecture, such as, such as social engagement? Because that's a very important fact that we talk about um, the building itself is just not mortars and you know bricks and mortars, it's got a life. And it's the social aspects of each of the buildings, and the concerns are very important. I'll go on this one. <laughs> you know, great architecture has always been about the social. Uh, it's only when, it's only when, uh, you know, because you would never build a building. Buildings, no matter how small or large they are, they, they, they take. You, you need to. It's, it involves a great initiative from many people uh, to make it. No one is going to do it unless there is a need for it. You know, you build buildings because there is a need to gather, to work, to learn, to sleep in. So there is always a social dimension to architecture. It's only when, you know, architecture has been, become a tool for speculation, where somehow architectures perhaps, perhaps kind of, um, uh, beauty, if you like, superficial beauty, has uh, become a tool for speculation and has um, suppressed perhaps its social dimension. But I, I, I think we need to remember that architecture and social go together, always. 
Uh, that's, you know, and, and of course, in the context of the award, we are not going to talk about any architecture but great architecture. I think you can, you, I can add to that. Can you just remind us of those two projects? What are they? This is one of the Sudan, the and hospital in Sudan, Sudan, and the other one is Birzeit. Yes, okay. So, so in a way, the images, without even thinking about the projects, <clears throat> say something about architecture beyond the artifact or the aesthetic, mm -hmm. because you're seeing people doing things. I know the one to the to the left quite well, and it actually is a wholly, um, let's call it, political social project, because it was a hospital built by an NGO. Center of Excellence in the middle of Sudan. And I was fortunate enough to review that one. So I, I remember that one of the questions was always, it's made out of containers and things like that. But the point was that it was a particular problem in Eastern Africa about heart disease for young kids. And Center of Excellence was needed. So there was a political question about who would fund that. Some NGO funded it, found a local architect from Italy, went on to build it transformed uh, heart conditions for kids in that area to the extent where the East African community, seven or eight countries, are certainly now who normally don't speak with each other mm -hmm. because of tribal issues and languages, do send all their kids to this hospital if there is an issue with their heart. The, the other one is in Palestine. Yes. So, you know, even there, again, it's difficult not to mention the names, but the way construction happens in that part of the world, most of you will have seen on CNN. And, and it is difficult to do it at night. They have to find materials from somewhere. It, it's not easily accessible. So both of these slides, in a way, speaks clearly to the fact that the bit that is aesthetic and design excellence and the things you're enjoying about this building are only one aspect of architecture. Architects have to do a lot more on these projects, I think, show that. I think the award they, tends to engage with this better than most of the awards. But, but you know, sorry, I just, I, I mean, I think when we're talking about a hospital or, um, let's say, a market, I mean, the social component is uh, is uh, somehow a little bit more vivid. But, uh, you know, I, um, I, my favorite example is remains the car park, uh, which, you know, a car park is also a building that is important in a city, you know, and in cities where people drive or have to drive. Uh, you know, a car park is as important as a market and as important as um, a hospital. It, they have their own place. So I, I think this is, there are, the car park is also, a it has social values. Uh, and, and that's where I think, you know, architects do not escape it. Uh, um, you know, I think that that's what the strength of architecture is. Uh, I, 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 I think the word design sometimes confuses it because uh, it, it, it suggests that it's, it's more to do with kind of image. Uh, Talking about um, uh, social aspects, um, now we call this save the planet because there's a sense of measuring architecture by call to save the planet. Is there a risk that being mesmerized by this we may replace history of architecture with technology. But this is important, I mean, because today we're talking about certain aspects, which is environment, sustainability, etc. These are the things that we're hearing every day. But what is that? I mean, because technology and what's the history of architecture is something which is sometimes might not be in common. I think it's a, it's a very good question because there is a, a all everybody today, if you walked here, you can see how many people are actually on the phone and walking into things. So technology is brutally taking over everything. And in that question, with you know, using the, the background of these awarded projects, I think there is a danger that um, technology is taking over so much that it, even when we are pretending to save the planet for climate change, for example, some technologies and some data, big data, big scale of interventions that you even see in this particular master plan are technological. They're not really about saving the planet. So they might be addressed you know, quite rudely. You know, they, they buy a Hummer and paint it green and they say that's actually now saving 
petrol. And that's the extent to which the technology, I think, could actually be quite deceiving. What's important, I think, is that the architects don't always face that. They, they have the skills, opportunities, and education to often the best ones to use the technology as an instrument. So when it comes to saving the planet, if they start thinking bigger and engaging better with technology and technologists, they might actually get towards a solution that I would say is more humanitarian than technological. Currently, I think there is a far too much technology in architecture. I, I think there is too much technology for some architecture. Okay, so if you're designing um, any big building today, you know, you need to get certification for depending on which country you're, you're in for LEED or RIAM or etc. And, uh, you know, there is there is somebody, an engineer, not a structural engineer, um, you know, there uh, who gives you a kind of a spreadsheet with, you know, the stuff that you can afford uh, to use uh, in the project so that you would get this certification. But I think architecture has other ways which are actually not reliant on, on technology uh, to save the planet, which is what kind of materials you use, where do you source them from, how thick are your materials, where, how do you orientate the building, where do you put your uh, uh, windows so that you create airflow. I mean, these are deep ingrained in the history of uh, you know, architecture, which many of which come actually from the Muslim civilization because they had to uh, they had to work within very often, um, you know, strong uh, climates uh, where the architecture had to be equally strong. Uh, and therefore, we have cities like Yaz, and we have, you know, I, I know all the kind of Iranian examples of, you know, cisterns that uh, uh, had to do with kind of cooling buildings and wind towers. And, and these things are there. Uh, and I'm not saying we should use those again but we should invest our time into sticking in those directions. I, I, I mean, now Fashid gave me a nice opportunity to actually look at what, we're, <laughs> what, what the audience is seeing. One is the Wadi Halifa, right? And the other one's Indonesia or something. Yeah. Yeah. So these are relevant in that com question about technology because I know the one to the right with the very dense housing, there was no in technological intervention. They just put some toilets in and made very good infrastructure in the streets, which then allowed, there was no technical um, or technological intervention. And it was the idea of the architect, with the one and the same, I think, trying to recreate a waterway, which, which if you left it to the engineers and the technologists might have been damning something. But the, I think the architects brought another way of looking at it. And I suppose it's the inverse of your question that in these situations, it shows again that where the, the architect's hand is stronger and, and thinking better, they use the tools in a slightly different way. I would still, being a, a technologist, maintain the fact that we are taking over the world. There is no question. <laughs> Well, the, the whole thing is that, again, it's the level of technology. I mean, just uh, because you've ex explained a little bit about the two images, uh, the reason which I think one of them is, which is these, uh, what they call the kampungs in Indonesia, these are kind of uh, slums. These are slums which have been happening, they're, uh, they're urban slums, and they're huge. They're, they're called, like, it's a series as uh, each of them is so, so big, like uh, a part of the, I mean, borough of London. But they lacked, because they were built so, Quickly, they lacked all the infrastructure. But what happened there, it was a technology, but it was a very simple technology was introduced. It was introduced with the people, but just making the new switches. The way that you introduce, but just changing switches and making these uh, toilets, etc. the people started investing there. So it becomes that this becomes, this technology is very rudimentary technology. It's not a very high tech, but high tech for the people who are living there. But it's come with a, with a, with a solution, and that solution brought back life, because it gave hope. Because if you give hope to people, that's where you can change a society. And sometimes with small technology uh, as a tool, you can give that hope to the people. On the other side, you've got the, the image on, on your left hand side, which is in Saudi Arabia, one of the richest uh, um, places in the world. And they had the climate was very important. And just by accident, they found there was this wadi, there was this riverbed, which was most of the time uh, dry. But just by accident, because 
actually a, a big part of it because it belonged to very rich people. Nobody had access to it. And then little by little, the sewage which was created, it leaked and came and became a river. Little by little, this river changed the whole city. The environment changed. And for Saudi Arabia, they built a huge for 40 kilometers length with $160 million, which is nothing in Saudi Arabia. But they created such, it was because of these engineers that helped them to help the architects and landscape architects that they really changed the whole city. So it means that high technology, it's, it's not a matter of how much money you have, it's not a matter of that, what kind of level of technology you have, but technology that's done correctly can be a big plus to the building. Now, I come to another totally different thing we're talking about, um, about technology, is the word innovation. Because innovation is something which goes always with architecture. Can we discuss about how innovation through the lens of building systems, concerns of local capacity, scale gaps, how that can help in changing the society, I mean, changing the architecture of society. Um, I'm not sure whether I, I know where you want me to take the question, but, uh, well, you know, if we analyze the word innovation, innovation means taking something that exists and changing it. Uh, so it brings in a lot of what we've just been discussing. It's about, you know, taking an uh, account of your heritage, of what you know before, but understanding the need for change, recognizing the need for change, and developing, uh, you know, new new solutions, uh, and you know, being imaginative, being creative, so that you take what you know already and you change it for the better. So it's not about um, you know, radical change, it's not about erasure, it's not about complete new out of the vacuum, it's about creating, creating, recognizing the need also for change. It's part of, you know, the, the word innovation. So it is, it is a good word because, you know, buildings cannot, I think society will have to so radically change overnight for us not to value innovation because you know, in, you know, if you're doing a new office building today, you will not need to change everything from scratch. There are some elements of the office building, as we've known it until now, which will be, which will continue to be relevant. We could even look at it, let's say a car. You know, if you had to design a car tomorrow, unless you decide that you are not going to have cars anymore, then there are some things that you will keep and there are areas that you will, and I think that buildings, Buildings change at the same rate of change. Uh, we may change the way we occupy them. Uh, we may change the way we build them. We may change the way we um, supply, let's say, <coughs> certain materials to them. And at every decade or two, perhaps the scale of change so much is that we really see a kind of a new direction to architecture. Uh, but in between, uh, practice should not be blunt. In between, we continue to, to, to change things more incrementally. And those changes matter. Matter for the world that surrounds us and, the, and our life. No, I would support all of that completely. I mean, the direction innovation is going in is it's marginal rather than very big moves. Um, and just supporting what you were saying. What does innovation look like? I think the slides are, are, are pretty good examples because the one to the left is the Hajj Terminal, which was a major innovation as a building system because it's a fabric roof, one of the first ever in the world in the 80s. I think that's why you you were there, I wasn't, but that's why you would have remediated it at the time. <coughs> Certainly, it's, um, it's changed the direction of that kind of building system works. We use it on stadiums and, and, and things, but if you go back to the scale of that, it's something like 60 hectares as a space. I've been there and I can tell you that 60 hectares means two and a half times the scale of King's Cross as a single roof surface. That is enormous, you know, when people come into a hut. So it transformed the way we think about covering large spaces as a building system. And innovation at big scale is rare these days. The Bridge School is, is probably one of the favorite projects amongst master juries and steering committees because it's in China and it's literally a bridge that joined two communities. So as a metaphor of joining communities, very small school. The innovative 
building that was also a bridge, but essentially it re regenerated, if, I, if I'm right, the two communities started to talk to each other and so on. So there are scales of innovation and I think it's a daily process for us. I mean, whenever we're working together, we're always trying to find something to innovate. It's not easy anymore, but you know, that's a part and parcel of where society is taking us. Now that you talked about, we were, we were supposed not to talk about each individual project, but it's very interesting the innovation when we talk about the word innovation. Here on the small school in China, it is this is an innovation. It's not a technical technological innovation because it's a very simple building. But what the story is that there were two villages on opposite sides of a, of a river, and they were they didn't talk to each other because if they wanted to see each other, they had to go something like three kilometers to pass a bridge to go to the other side and get to them. So this architect, by making this, you know, in, and they needed the school, and they couldn't afford the school for both villages to build two schools. They built, the architect came with two, a two-room school, which is conceived as a bridge. At the same time, it links the two sides of it, but what is very interesting, it's not only a school, it's a space for people. So, and have, as you can see there, the doors of the school opens, it becomes a kind of a, 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 a theory scene that people in the, they can come and watch a show or a film, uh, whatever. So this is an innovation, it means in a society, you, the architect has innovated, come back with something which has existed, the need, answer to, this, uh, to the needs of the, that society, which is a school and a bridge, all in one building, at the same time, making a social link between two, not arch enemies, but quite not very friendly um, villages. Now, this is, a, now we're talking about one element that we've been talking about a lot is an AKDN, is the AKDN ethics in action. So this is a, I mean, this is uh, something which we discussed with uh, Hanif, who is always involved. Say that, the Akilian ethics in action is a long list. Can we just pick up one which is education and research? As you're both engaging with education, both at Harvard, I don't know why you're Harvard, you're teaching there, you're in London, I don't know that's how that works. But anyway, how do you see the effect of this sort of engagement on education of architects in the past and the near future? Is it transformational impact? Does it lead to questioning the role of architects? Fashid is the expert on education, but on the ethics side, um, I could just say that the, the ethics that are on the Acadian website, I think there are seven or eight, if we go into each one, we'll be here for weeks and we'll be debating whether they are they should be there or not, but to pick on one that, that I think is relevant, I think one of the, the stones of those ethics is uh, the value of, of uh, ethic, ethical value of education and research. Um, my, from my perspective, it's a very easy one, uh, because being an engineer at a design school, it's pure and, and joy just to watch how research is done and how education has changed, just by the fact that they have invited somebody who is actually not an architect to come in and, and think about the way they will re-educate the architect in the future. So I think the ethical connection through education is one that um, we, we probably not um, credit to the award in its entirety. But as practitioners, you know, we have probably met each other through these events and through uh, a way of working through the award perhaps, and then gone on to educate or re-educate the way we think uh, with students. So, you know, we give them a different question to answer. So I think there is a, co a connection I and mean, it, it has had, had a, an impact depending on which world you belong to. There is a very negative impact as well, which is that you know many of the American schools will see the work done in Africa with mud bricks and ask all the students to build in mud bricks, which is bizarre, but it is the fault of the award in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, today are, uh, um, uh, everyone's idea of what uh, what education is for or should be, you know, is is, is changing. Uh, you know, people now talk about learning rather than educating, uh, and that you go to the university to learn from each other. 
rather than to be taught. So uh, these ideas are, are kind of uh, very much kind of uh, all questions are alive. But personally, I, I, I think um, the value of having spaces uh, for for learning or even education uh, is 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 that we 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 isolate uh, chunks of time uh, for uh, <coughs> learning the discipline of learning. Um, you know, I think that no matter if you go whatever you go and study, let's say architecture. Yes, it is long. Maybe let's say five years of being at university, it's never going to prepare you adequately to come out and be an architect. It's impossible. For a start, by the time you leave, the issues would have changed. You know, if you are in England, you would have done five projects. Uh, and if you're in America, you would have done 10, because the year is divided into two semesters. 10 projects are not going to make you an architect. It's impossible. So I, I think that it's not so much about going to be prepared for the world of practice, but learning the discipline of learning so that when you come out, you can continue to learn. It's about learning to be critical, learning to look at the world in certain ways, learning to look for information, learning to look at the world so that you can be um, engaged with it, you know, uh, critically. Uh, I, I think that's the value, and that's why probably we like teaching, because we go back and we, we, you know, we steal time from our practice uh, in order to continue to learn and to be inside that kind of space of, uh, you know, looking at the, you know, the discipline of thinking about architecture. Sure. And, and I think that that's why, and, and, uh, you know, I enjoy teaching and, and uh, that's why I, I also, you know, feel quite uh, passionate about passing on also what I know so that, you know, what people don't have to start from scratch again. Um, now I'm turning, because both of you have been involved with over many years, with many cycles, in many ways as both architects, reviewers, um, steering committee members. Um, there's one question for everyone, is what, what's the, what are the criteria for choosing why something is better than the other? Why a project is better? And also, how do, uh, how do um, come up with this, is there any themes and concerns that has been arising for all your discussions and your thoughts? I mean, are these predefined? What are, from the beginning, you want, that's what you want to go and find when you're having to look at new projects? Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> She's so polite, always. No, <laughs> but there is, a, the, the answer is, is there is no preconceived idea. You saw from the video, they might not have heard it, that. 40 years ago, when uh, the first steering committee chaired by His Highness was set up, there was a particular process and governance set up. One of the things about that is it's run by His Highness. He chairs and stewards it. And unlike many of the steering committees that I sit on, he gives every person a real chance to talk about it and, and forces us also to then go beyond that and select a master jury. Okay, there is a predetermined idea about what constituents that master jury needs, the numbers and so on. But essentially there's a freedom because of the way the award was set up 40 years ago. And I, I would say that that, that um, <coughs> kind of doesn't force us into a situation where we deal with what we heard on CNN yesterday. You know, we're always, because of the nature of that system, you're always meeting philosophers, new architects on the jury, you're, you're reviewing projects with different people every three years and reading about different projects. So it forces us not to necessarily think about the short term topics and themes. And in my experience, certainly this cycle, for example, the recent meeting that it was really about finding a, a jury that will identify newer themes so that the, the, there isn't a, a, you know, a, a staleness that comes out of this. So, I, I don't think the themes come up through premeditation. They come up through kind of confrontation, discussion, um, respect with each other, and actually being able to erode those differences, <coughs> all of which I would give credit to the Secretariat and, and, and the awards, because they watch us doing this. And whenever we're out of order, 
I think it comes back to... Don't to, say these things. No, no, but <laughs> it comes back to an ordered situation of some sort, I would say. But maybe just to add really what, what you've said, uh, I mean, it's important to, to mention that the projects are nominated uh, by people outside the award. Uh, and the award is awarding, you know, the best projects out of those that are nominated from the outside. So it couldn't possibly be preempted. Uh, since the job of uh, you know the master jury is to look at those and categorize them uh, and make sure that the projects both represent excellence in architecture uh, in on the student abroad sense but also uh, cover as much ground in terms of steam territory etc because obviously if the idea is to um, uh, to use the award as, as encouragement for further excellence, then obviously it needs to cover a wide uh, area. So, uh, obviously the answer is no. <laughs> um, I've got two more questions for you. Um, in an era where revitalization and rehabilitation is as important socially as rapid urbanization, how can we learn from the award? Should we be prioritizing, let's say, housing? Because, you know, housing is one of those things that every single person needs a house. And then that, that is something which becomes the most essential in, in the world of architecture, of building. Okay, well, well, I mean, you know, I think that we, uh, housing currently in the UK, uh, is a, a, a huge problem and, and it's on everybody's mind. But I would have thought, you know, uh, uh, there are different issues uh, that are at different scales of urgency depending on which area of the world we are talking about. We are talking about the Muslim civilization that, you know, its territory is the world. So um, housing is definitely important. I think homelessness is very important at the moment here. Um, and it's, uh, it's something that is like, I think it's just one of the saddest things to see on the streets of London. And, but there are, you know, other issues. Do you think that it should be housing over other things? Um, I, right now I do, only because um, we don't get enough examples in any awards, not just awards, of, of good quality housing being put forward for, for, uh, for all the things we've talked about, you know, to be replicated or to be rethought. So it's the type that is probably the least attended to by all of us, including the constructors, and, and it's obvious why. But it isn't necessarily because of rapid urbanization, nor because you have to revitalize a particular area. It's just one of those things that uh, the globalization and, and capitalism, to some extent, is driven, where the most important type of building is not brought to the fore. I don't think it's through a lack of effort on the parts of architects to, to not want to do it. But society at the moment doesn't seem to allow it. You have two very good examples on the screen, one in Singapore, is that, is that right? Yeah. And one in India, which, which are rare projects. I don't know how many you've awarded on housing, but the one in India, the Doshi one, I know quite well, where it isn't a housing system, it's an infrastructure system that allows for varying incomes, something we're now trying to do in London. How do you provide for the key worker the, the person who's over 70 and a nursery school on the same site. To date, that model doesn't exist in London. You just uh, look at King's Cross. Great example of who's living here. It immediately draws the attention of what is housing today and how can we actually rethink the way we, we make houses so it's affordable. I think. So yeah, it should be prioritized in some way. I think you've been doing some work in the background. Well, in France, not yeah. here. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I think. Sorry, I, just to kind of add, um, because I haven't been in the in the kind of uh, the last uh, few cycles, so I didn't know that there was nothing on housing. I think, yeah. in a way, when the, the when the problem is, um, I, I know it, it is the case in the UK that you know when either the property um, prices are very high. And uh, the market is really strong, and so the people who are delivering housing get away with murder of just building to sell and make maximum profit. And obviously, that's not the agenda of the award. Uh, or then there is the opposite case, which we are now moving on to, where there is a shortage, and the shortage of numbers um, outweigh. 
the quality of life that people give. Because then people think they just have to provide the bare minimum, put a little bit of nice kind of skin on the outside, and uh, then you're delivering the right number of housing. So it's a very difficult territory. Uh, and it's for sure an area where you know we need good patrons for housing. It's not, it's, as we all know, it's not just the architect. Mm. Uh, you know, you know, you really do need the patron. You need the circumstances that look at housing for all of its uh, kind of relevances, and not just because you're creating accommodation to people. You, you gave a very important uh, point, a very important issue, which is it needs a system as a patron. For example, in, in the case of Singapore, the whole. Uh, problem of housing is dealt very differently to anywhere else in the world because it has it's seen as a part of the whole country so the whole society's program and that's why that everybody is can get a housing a proper housing in the scale of a country well the country is very small but that's not the question it's the whole thing that how you deal with that problem um, just the last question which I kind of have is that about public space because we talked about housing that's where you live but most of your time that you're not sleeping, you're outside, you are in the public space. And so public space has become a cliche, but as we can see at King's Cross and as the catalyst for enhancing urban development, can architects really have a role in design in public spaces? You see the role of it's more of, a, the, um, of the um, architects or other people who are in, involved in this, uh, in making the whole uh, the built environment. Yeah. Okay, so public space is a cliche that is used often for getting planning and over and over again. My, my own opinion of it is that there is very little public space in most of most developed countries and cities in particular, even in London, and, and we might call what's out here public space, but we all know it's not really because you have to first define who is the public that can get access to this place. And can people traveling from far out to get here. So one thing is that I think it's lost, it's been lost to non-designers in many ways and the application of gadgets and, and um, items, you know, greenery and water and so on, is sometimes not the way um, I would perceive public space to be. I would expect it to have communities coming there for picnics and do all sorts of very interesting things. I'm, I'm sure that King's Cross is a good example of that because you do see movies and things going on, but on the screen you have a, probably one of the most controversial examples in Copenhagen to the left where around it is one of the most controversial cities in Europe when it comes to Muslim civilizations. Very small population of Muslims, but that was permeated particularly as to, to draw out, I suppose, this idea of the combination of architect artists working together to to, to create a marbling effect of public space, so you do have some belonging. I'm not convinced by all of it, you know, putting a Moroccan fountain to, 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 to encourage Moroccan conversations might be one way of doing it, which is what they did. What is useful, I suppose, in, in that kind of design is that it does allow you to still be yourself and you know, keep their identity and look at the other's identity all in the same space, which to me is, is a much better Public space. I don't know what the image of the right is. Reforestation. Well, I mean, um, I think buildings have public spaces within them. It's not just, uh, you know, outdoor space. So one of my favorite examples is the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. Um, uh, it's. I'm not sure if it was. It has done it uh, consciously, but the the lobby is uh, lifted and there are escalators taking you off to the lobby. So the ground floor is covered, but open. And every Sunday, ever since um, you know, shortly after it, 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 it finished, it has become the destination uh, uh, for the Filipino communities, mainly women, to picnic there. And this is just the ground floor of a building. Or in New York, uh, you know, at some point, <coughs> the, the kind of the planning authority um, came up with this idea that uh, if people, if developers or people who were building buildings uh, would um, provide space for the public 
inside the buildings, uh, they could grow taller. So it was an initiative, you know, that they kind of created. And New York is now has uh, more than a hundred of these spaces. One of my favorite is the IBM building, where you know, whenever I'm in New York, I would end up there to rest for a while because you know you are walking up and down the grid somehow makes you forget how long you walked and if you're a visitor you walk a lot uh, even more and it's a space where you can walk in you don't have to buy any coffee you don't have nobody comes to tell you anything you can sit down for as long as you want and, and new york is full of this and london has recently tried to do that like the top of the walkie-talkie built 20 century street is supposed to be that but of course it's not because um it wasn't well planned, and because you can't go up with your sandwich, uh, you know, and, and have it. But I think buildings can be public too. It's not just open spaces. Well, maybe I, I can just add something to that. It's a public space is where there's a sense of belonging, because that's what was important. That you go to a space, to a place, and you feel that you belong to that place, and that place belongs to you. And if that relationship with the space, with the society and the, and the, uh, and the space is not created, people feel that they are alien and the space is alien to them. And that's very important. In some, that's why some of the public spaces do work and some of them don't work. Uh, and we just, because we are five minutes late, because that's because uh, Luis came late. And that was the whole main, main reason. But uh, just if... As you've noticed, we didn't speak about very particularly, not, we didn't talk about history of architecture, we didn't say that where these projects are, why these projects are important. What we want to try, was trying to do is that to bring up the questions, the concerns, which is general. Everybody should be aware of these issues, and that's why we, we picked up a number of issues and we brought it up to you for discussions. Uh, here, just to give you a little like, like a homework, if if you're interested in any of these projects, you can go to our website, which on each of these, on most of these projects, there's a two, three minutes film. Films are the, the way that you best understand it in architecture, because it's not images, it's not only photographs and drawings, but it's about how people walk through a place and how they feel they can express that. And that's very important. So if you have got any, uh, want to have more information, you can be most welcome to see that. I think maybe we can have five minutes of any questions or any, I mean, if you dare asking questions, please do so. <laughs> um, I can ask my God. Um, so thank you for the amazing presentation. Um, uh, like speaking of, uh, like putting aside the client's role in the process and uh, focusing on the social aspect of architecture um, and stemming from that the people are like the final users of buildings in the end. Um, what do you think about uh, participatory development, participatory design in terms of the architect? Like, um, what do you think about, about the concept itself and where do you see the role of the architect in this process, in such process? Well, may I take this? Participatory design. Well, I mean, I think um, architects would, would love to be engaged in such processes, but they, they are rare. They are rare. But I tell you one, one experience that I've had recently, which I think is, is great, which is that we, we were working on this uh, housing block uh, for Nanterre, so which is just on the edge of Paris. And, um, you know, I discovered that with the internet, suddenly the future the prospective residents can actually contact us and we were in touch. So it wasn't a process that the client facilitated, but that it was really my first experience where these were um, these, these were flats, apartments that people bought off plan. So they, they see plans, they put money down, and then the building starts uh, you know, being built. And it takes a few years for the building to be built. And suddenly, I, 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 uh, for the first time, I saw that you know these people were were reaching out to us and they wanted to be engaged in the process of their you know in their building their building and they were asking for changes in the and it was fascinating and, and it was uh, actually very enjoyable but it's it's not something that architects um, find very often the, the closest of participation is them working with the client but not with the end user and so because the clients are not always and use it very rarely. So I, th I think for an architect, it's it's an enjoyable process because it's otherwise you're just speculating. 
you are speculating what might be the right thing. So the award's been going on for 40 years. And when the award started, uh, as you pointed out, that the awards are given to buildings in which are already being used. And so then an assumption is made by the jury and an award is given. Then over the 40 year period, has the award followed up the consequences of the award itself and whether the buildings that serve the initial purpose continue to serve them or have they changed? Um, this is a question that we come across a lot that what happens and you give a, at a certain moment you give an award to a building and this is, uh, this building and this is the architect so because what's very important we give an award to the building to a project and not to the architect not to the so it's a it depends uh, it's who's got the most uh, uh, role in the achievement of that project clients builders people who live there all of them depending on the each project. But we cannot go and guarantee that that excellence remains because this is not something that we can do. We have recognized that moment, that building in that period to give the message and that is our role. Uh, there is, there have, we have got out of the 116 projects which have been on the wall, a couple of them have been destroyed, they don't exist anymore, that's the reality of the world. Uh, some has been in very good conditions. The Petronas Towers is, I mean, is there forever. It depends on the nature of the project. And some people, some projects have just developed, uh, multiplied by many, like the Kampung Improvement Program. It was a small project, which was, when it was awarded, it, because it was awarded, it was repeated and repeated and repeated. So it became an ongoing process. But we cannot go and look at those changes anymore because we, we are, I mean, we are just giving the award. We are not responsible. We're not the students of that. I hope I've, I've, I've answered your question. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentations. My question is about ethics in action in architecture. I'm, an, I'm not an architect. I'm an educationist. So my question um, is for any of you. Uh, well, how real is the challenge? for an architect when he or she decides to build a building, uh, when he or she has to balance the incentive, the monetary incentive for building a structure and keeping in mind the social, real social uh, aim of the structure, the social role of the building. And what could, could be done uh, from the society or from the, uh, from the community of architects actually to bring these two things in balance? Thank you. Sorry. Um, um, I, I think that uh, the, 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 the challenge that uh, this kind of the relationship between the architect and, and society, this kind of relationship uh, faces, is of course that the architect is ultimately working for someone uh, who is asking this person to, you know, to deliver. And uh, rarely, do you have a client who has the kind of ethics that you're asking for in mind? Okay, architecture is, you know, 90% of the time it has become a tool for speculation. Uh, now, I haven't lost hope. I think there is a way for architects to work a little bit more subversively in this system. And that requires that the architect you know, stops thinking that they are this kind of powerful whatever person who's going to design a sketch and is going to be implemented. The architect has to be involved in the process and work under the radar to find opportunities within the process to steer things towards change. And it may be that you carry a kind of a double agenda where you have your agenda, which is about the kind of ethics that you're talking about, and you have the real agenda of the client because they're actually investing their money on that site, you know, and asking you and presenting this scenario where you can even be subversive with it. I, I think that it's a lot harder, uh, but I think it's, uh, you know, it's not a, it's not a lost game. And, and very often, those situations, there is more at stake. There is actually more at stake. 
if you get somebody to, to ask you to build a luxury housing in the middle of Mayfair, what is that stake? Nothing. But I, I, I'd like to just add uh, from an engineer's perspective slightly. I think there is a, a more direct uh, question there, which is it depends on the nature of the individual as well, what their own ethical values might be, but also where they are in their career. You know, when you start a business, somebody comes and asks you to do something stupid because you have to survive, you have to do it. But when you've achieved the, the sort of reputation as you heard from Louis, that Fashid has and others, they have the, 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 the opportunity to change the question and most clients will change direction. I can give you two very good examples. One is on the South Bank of London where on a 26 story building we've added 11 stories, a very well known story in London. We, with the architect, changed the question. The, the, the client had come to us with let's knock this down and build a tower and we told them they could actually add and make the same tower much quicker and faster and so on. So ethically, it was the right thing to do. But I have to, because of the sustainability argument, but I have to be very honest with you, most of the logic behind it, because we made a shitload of money doing it that way around. So there's no, there's no hiding behind that. And that will then fund something else. And the second example I would give you where I still struggle often is, is in Azerbaijan, you know, when we did the Hyder Aliyev project, which has a lot of controversy with Saadid. There was a big question mark because the leader of that country was perceived to be somebody you ethically mustn't uh, support. But the point was the point: the country was in a stage where it needed recognition symbolically as an, in, in an Islamic world. So the decision we made as a group of people was we will screw the ethics. You know, we want to bring this country up and we will do it for that reason. And the technological challenge was more important. So I think it changes depending on where you are and what, what, what you really want to achieve out of it. We take, I think, two more questions and then we finish. Oh, we've got five. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is just from a distant observer. And, uh, and, and I'm thinking more about um, the Aga Khan Award for Architecture as an institute. Uh, do you think, and this is just uh, maybe playing devil said, okay, is that do you think that there is too much technical, elitist, specialized uh, lens? Um, I mean, in terms of those who are um, defining criteria, making judgments, um, for example, architectures, speaking and having dialogue more with architectures. So there is a community of specialization, which is, you know, has done a wonderful job so far. But having gone through the process of 40 years, does the award feel a need to engage with increasing dialogue with educationists, sociologists, anthropologists, and maybe connect with the masses rather than, uh, you know, just remaining in the circles of specialized vocabularies and knowledge? Well, I don't agree with you. First, <laughs> um, the re first of all, one of the very specificities of the Alcon Award for Architecture versus other awards is that it always engages, all, it's got five, six architects on the jury, on the steering committee, but it always has got social scientists, artists, engineers, uh, historians, and other disciplines. And it's very important, you know, as exactly what you said, let's say if we've got a few architects sitting on the same panel, and they all know when they start the discussion, they, they, the other one knows exactly what he's saying, so they say yes or no. But when they want to explain, when an engineer wants to explain why socially this building is important to a non-architect, to a philosopher, then he will think again, because by saying it, explaining it to someone else, it changes, uh, it changes the way that you explain things. So sometimes you revisit what you've, the question you've asked. So this, the Argonne Award for Architecture is not only amongst the elitist group of architects at all. It has always been involved and engaged. At the same time, it's the first, it's the only award which has been, they, we sent someone to go and see the projects and talk to the people, talk to the users. We are not working on just how the, what the drawings look like, etc. It's not at all a specialist approach. It is a very, uh, right to the point, right to the people, and that is very important. That makes that was that actually has been the the reason, the main reason for that is that we, we because we as an institution we are looking back what we have been doing and where we are, and what 
is most important that all these successive, um, um, the 13 successive uh, juries, the selection, what they have selected, was always relevant to the time. They're talking about projects which are old because they've been built, but the discussions, the discourse is always, has been always relevant to time. And that's what we're looking for. That's why we have a system which is working between these juries, the, 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 the steering committee, the master jury, the reviewers, the nominators. With this mechanism, has been able to, up to now, to make it that the award to be always relevant to its time. And I think that is something we hope that we can continue. And what it is by bringing new blood. Each time we're bringing new people to the system, we're, bringing, uh, we're going to, this, uh, to the field, asking the, the people what are the needs, and that's where exactly we do. Could I just add to what you said, if I may? Uh, I mean, I think that in terms of um, going to the masses, uh, you know, what the award does between one cycle and the other is spend quite a lot of time uh, organizing workshops, organizing lectures, organizing exhibitions. So actually, the moment of the award and, and uh, you know, celebrating the success and achievement of a set of projects becomes food for discussion for an entire cycle in between. So I think it's not really right what you're saying. It's, it's actually quite impressive, uh, the, the kind of the community that uh, I, I think worldwide, uh, it, it, you know, if, if uh, I may say so, uh, really just like it, there is a kind of a, a floating community around the award uh, that really look forward to the projects that get uh, premiated and, and this community uh, grows. You know, I wasn't part of the award, but I feel myself as part of the family, you know, ever since I joined it, even though I'm not sitting on the steering committee now, I am part, I feel part of the family. I care about the projects that get awarded, I care about the, the, the people who continue to be on the jury or get selected on the steering committee, I care about the events. So I, I actually think that its impact is, is enormous and it is actually connected and maybe you should take time to learn about those venues. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, have to, I, just say, I just want to borrow one quote from uh, Edward de Bono who said that putting a guitar in your hand doesn't make you a musician. So, you know, in a way, if you go to the masses who are not necessarily going to, to perform, it would be irresponsible and unethical of us as professionals and the awards to actually go to those masses. So there is a balance, there is a balance to play, and, and it's not in my fact, quote, by the way. Fact, that's why I profess. And second, I am an ethnographer. So for me, masses takes a different meaning altogether. Okay. Right, right, right. So I was coming from that angle. Jasmine, you had a question. Um, I first of all, uh, I would just like to say that the awards have been amazing. The uh, projects that have um, been awarded have been so inspirational and um, creativity and the uh, enthusiasm for architecture uh, has, you know, I don't think there's any other prize for architecture that does it quite this way in such a global manner uh, and involves so many people. So firstly, I, I really want to thank you and congratulate you for, for what you've done. I also want to be very critical about the stage that you've um, uh, got where you've got 50% women and 50% men, because that's not where architecture is. And a lot of the comments about participation and technology and um, uh, all of those things are, are, I think, demonstrate that the profession is very skewed, where, where it's like a profession that's just walking or hopping on one leg and using one eye. Um, because the talents and the contribution that women make are very rarely recognised. However, the award does, um, um, the, the, the numbers of women who uh, have put forward projects and they have been recognised, uh, I think is amazing. Uh, and I don't know if there's anything that you can do to encourage people to open their eyes to the contribution that women make, because the talent is there, we can see it on the stage, <laughs> and um, uh, and I think it's a shame that so much talent gets trashed because it doesn't get the opportunity. Well, um, maybe I'll just explain. Uh, this is a main concern I mean, about the role of women in all, it's not only in the field of architecture, but in all disciplines. 
And um, I remember when I went to school, uh, there was, we, we, there were, we were 60 in that class, there were six girls and the rest were boys. Today, if you go to any architecture school in the Middle East, in the whatever, majority are women and a very small number of people are, uh, are men in, in each class. Um, but, but the whole thing is that we cannot have categories for that we have to promote women, architects, etc. By accident, the last cycle, out of six, six projects, three projects, the, the, the main designers were women. I mean, this was just happened by accident. It was not that we were looking for that. It's very important that we should encourage. I mean, you yourself have been working on that, so about the role of women. And I remember that uh, it was very interesting once uh, Yasmin had this presentation in South Africa, uh, that she was talking about that in, in England, in RIBA, women were not allowed to to enter to become a member of the RIB, and then they were walking with their these uh, their, their ruling his rulers during the make first uh, talk to the, to protest that we exist, we are architects, let us in in that club. So that is an ongoing um, situation everywhere, and I don't think that today nobody would say that you know there is a difference between you know genders. I mean, I'm not sure that if that is the can, case. Can I I'll just quickly, just just very quickly. Whilst there's the feminization of higher education, that's fine. But if you look at the percentage of women architects who are practicing, it's about 20%. And everyone goes, oh, well, women have babies. Well, you know, doctors have babies, lawyers have babies, um, you know, all these other professions have babies. But somehow, when architects have babies, it affects them. I, I'm, I have no idea why. But, but all, I'm, all I'm really saying... For, uh, no, I can yeah. tell you, look, I had a baby, and it didn't affect my work. But I think you're right. I think there is a problem I there that has to be recognised. One thing, and that is, it, it's like the Me Too campaign. That the women are there, the talent is there, but you don't see them, and it's not recognised. And, and the number of times that I've had... Pe I'm not saying this is you, but I'm saying generally the culture is that um, you automatically, and I've done it myself, you automatically go to a number of people, and, and somehow they all seem to be male, you know, there's a certain stereotype. And in order, and if you don't recognize that that stereotype is there, then you will not change it. And it's just recognizing, you know, uh, and because the women are there, that you just have to ask them, as you have tonight. And so, thank you. Um. Let's take one more question because I think we've just passed out of time. That's all? Up. Oh, you're the last. You talked about uh, ethics of architecture and architecture bridging communities and peoples. So I want to ask in, in more situations where communities are separated, like in, in Syria and Syria, what's the role of architects inside war zones at the time, and what's the role of artists outside the war zones in support people inside? Louis should answer that, I think. <laughs> I can tell you what uh, KTC is doing right now. We, for the past, uh, since last September, we have started to work the reconstruction of the Sukkot Sakatia in Aleppo. And um, we put together a team with two people coming from outside and local people. First thing was to um, train stonemasons because the young people want to work. So in September last year, we, we started a training training operation in the, the Citadel, and um, we trained 40 people, which today are earning their living as stonemasons. So there was a contribution of architecture to create jobs, and we are investing the uh, resources of the Contrast for Culture because we don't have any support from any foreign governments, given the sanctions against Syria. But we choose the, uh, in agreement with the uh, Department of Antiquities of Syria, um, we choose the souk because it's much more important than any monument, because it's a facility, you see, again, talking about what is the social role of architecture, it's a facility that will bring trade, commerce, and in a way, we'll have also the reconstruction of this small segment of the souk that will be finished between February and March in this coming year, 2019. It will bring psychologically the notion that we are coming back to normal life. So um, in that case, you can see what is the combination of architecture um, 
and uh, how could how important could be an operation like that in a post-war situation and also how important it is as a means of integration because the people uh, it's not a, a work only a technical work our people provide technical support but this uh, uh, is a social um, project in the sense that uh, the merchants are brought into the picture from the very beginning and they are going to be need to pay for their they are going to take care of the inside of the shops. We do the rest. We don't pay for the infrastructure. We pay for the reconstruction. And this creates, this cements the relationship. It creates a complicity that creates a, 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 an association. So this is a, only an example. Like if we had until 2 o'clock in the morning, we can have what we do in Afghanistan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Just to end, I think what is important is if the, the role of architects in this case, of course, especially post-war, is to create hope. Because if there's no hope, there's no future. And that's the most important thing. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.